Let's just turn to the Scriptures at this point, Psalm 126. We have been reading some of these songs of degrees of the last number of weeks. Um, we come to this Psalm 126. It's probably one of the familiar, uh, more familiar uh, ones of the songs of degrees. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was her mouth filled with laughter, and her tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us. We're off we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Amen. We know the Lord will add his own blessing upon the reading of his own infallible word this morning. Let's just unite our hearts together in a word of prayer, seeking the Lord's blessing for our meeting. Our Heavenly Father, we come again into Thy presence in the Savior's precious and all-prevailing name, thanking Thee again for the return of Thy day. Oh, we bless Thee for Thy goodness toward us again in the week that has passed. We thank the Lord for preserving us. We thank the Lord for the measure of health and strength that each one of us have. And oh God, Thou hast been good to us, and Lord, we can raise her Ebenezer and say, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And we come, Lord, afresh to Thee this morning in worship and in adoration. And Lord, we would recognize, even as the hymn writer would pen those words, that we often, Lord, are weak, and the subtle temptations and troubles abound. But, O oh God, help us, Lord, in these days that we might keep on believing, and we might know that the Lord is ever near. We thank the Lord that thou art but a prayer away. We bless thee that thou hast bidden us to come with boldness unto the throne of grace. And we do so, Lord, again this morning, acknowledging that thou art God, but yea, Lord, acknowledging our own weakness, acknowledging, Lord, that we are nothing without thee. And Lord, we, O oh God, recognize that we have sinned even from day to day. And Lord, we've done those things we ought not to have done, and we've, Lord, omitted to do those things that we should have done. And we pray, Lord, for that cleansing in the precious blood. We ask, O oh God, for that fresh pardon and forgiveness that, Lord, there be no hindrance even to Thy blessing upon us today. Lord, we do remember our congregation and others that would look in and join with us this morning. And we ask, Lord, that thy blessing would be upon each one. And, Lord, that thou would remember our families and our loved ones. Thou would remember us, Lord, in these different days in which we're living. And, Lord, that thou would be pleased to, even, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. Oh, Lord, how Habakkuk was to pen those words. And the Lord is in his temple. And so, Lord, there for all the earth ought to keep silence before thee. And Lord, surely thou art speaking in these days. Help us, Lord, to have that listening ear. Help us, Lord, to have that heart that is uh, attentive to thy word and responsive to it. And O oh God, we pray that, Lord, we might recognize that the glory of the Lord will indeed fill all the earth, even as the waters uh, cover the seas. O oh God, we cry to thee that thou might come, Lord, and thou might bless us and Lord, that I would be pleased to give that needed grace from day to day. Lift up the, the head that hangs low. O oh God, we pray that thou would, uh, Lord, uh, cause that encouragement even in these days. Thank the Lord that thy purpose is being fulfilled. Thank the Lord thou art building thy church. And Lord, yet we do remember those who are led aside at this time. Bless William Graham at this time, Lord. We pray that thy hand will be upon him. So many uh, things that are wrong. And yet, Lord, thou art able to perfect that which concerneth him. Thank the Lord for sparing his life in that accident uh, some weeks ago. But, Lord, we pray for that improvement to be given, even from day to day. Give wisdom continually to the doctors and 
and the nursing staff. And Lord, as he goes through even these operations, Lord, we, uh, Lord, thank thee for your hand upon him. Remember Emma and the family as well. Be with them, Lord, at this time. We ask, Lord, for Ivan. We pray, Lord, that thou would draw near to him. We thank thee uh, for the treatment that he will be getting in these days. And we pray, Lord, that thou would perfect that which concerneth him that soon he might be out home again. Bless Rose at this time, Richard there in the home place. O oh God, meet with them, Lord, we pray. Lord, we pray that thou would comfort our hearts and thou would be near to them and bless them. We do thank, Lord, of others, of our elderly people. And Lord, they're in their homes even more so in these days. And Lord, we pray that thou would watch over them. And O oh God, that thou would uh, give them that needed grace and they might cast their all upon thy mercy. Remembering, of course, those who have been bereaved. Lord, we pray thou would yet bind up broken hearts, fill the empty chair. Lord, we pray that thou would draw near many homes across our wee province and our nation at large and further afield. Father, we look to thee, and that thou, Lord, that thou would even arise to thine aid, to our aid in these days. And, O oh God, that Lord, the heathen might be able to say, as we've read this morning, the Lord hath done great things for them, whereof they are glad. Remember our mission stations across our world. Thank thee for the uh, food parcels that have arrived safely and have been delivered uh, to those needy families. We pray, Lord, that thou would be pleased to cause them to feed the uh, Lord on the spiritual bread of life, that from which they will never hunger again. Remember the radio ministry, we thank thee again for it, going out even every week, uh, here and there and abroad. And Lord, we pray that thou would cause a listening ear to hear the word of truth, that many souls might be born again of thy Spirit. Remember, young people, our children, watch over them. Lord, help them in these days. Lord, where they cannot be in the school or, or they cannot be in the workplace, Lord, meet with them. O oh God, give them that little word from thyself. Draw near to their souls at this time. And we pray that they might feed well, even on the living word of God. So, Lord, abide with us. Bless us now as we further worship thee, as we come to thy word, as we come to the preaching. Lord, give us that needed help, even afresh this morning hour. We do ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I do want to welcome each one who's listening in. This morning, not only our own congregation, but others abroad as well. And we do welcome you in the Savior's precious and all-prevailing name. We're going out across the various platforms of Facebook and the YouTube and the Sermon Audio. And do remember uh, those meetings as they continue uh, even over these days and weeks that lie before us. Do remember Tuesday night, of course, is our prayer meeting Bible study. We have been engaged in a chapteral study of Ezra. We'll take it a little bit further in the next chapter. Maybe you'll be able to read it uh, before we get uh, to Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. So do remember that. Maybe other pieces as well for young people at this time. Please do remember to set aside the time of prayer uh, for our nation, for our province, for our people at this time. In the midst of this pandemic, uh, the Lord might be gracious and visit us even at this time. Remember elderly. Remember nurses and our care workers going in and out of houses and doctors, those on the front line. Remember those that have been bereaved as well. I want you to remember even those that I've already mentioned in prayer this morning. Uh, Brother William Graham needs the Lord's touch and take him upon your heart. Pray for him. Uh, the Lord might raise him up. And also Ivan and also a friend, uh, Derek, uh, that we've been praying about, Derek Preston. Maybe you'll remember him. And there's others. And do pray the Lord would be gracious and merciful unto them. Parents, remember, of course, the Sunday school lesson, 10 o'clock every Sunday morning, and then a children's meeting, 7 o'clock on Friday night as well. And, of course, next Lord's Day, we'll have the service usual times, 12 and 7, and the senior Bible class will be there, uploaded at a quarter to 11 as usual. So do tune in to those meetings if you can. Also, I would draw your attention to a mission online uh, that Martyrs is going to be doing this week at 7 o'clock, a Facebook page there uh, right throughout this week. So you might want to tune in there. It'll be about half an hour uh, each night at 7 o'clock. So do, again, remember that. And I trust that the 
the Lord's gracious hand has been upon you even since we uh, met last and will continue to do so in the days that lie ahead. Do you also remember the graveyard is open? Some people have been asking me about that. Uh, there's no reason why you can't uh, visit the graveyard. Uh, very rarely would there be others maybe in it when you're in it, but if there are, then you'll uh, know uh, the protocol uh, in the graveyard behind us here at the church. I want to take you this morning to uh, Second Chronicles. I'll give you a minute to find Second Chronicles chapter 11, and I want to uh, bring a little word uh, in season this morning. Uh, so you have First and Second Samuel's, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and it's the eleventh chapter, and we're going to read from the opening verses. Uh, verse one is where we will begin. Second Chronicles chapter eleven, then, and the words of verse one. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he gathered of the house of Judah and Benjamin an hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against Israel that he might bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam. But the word of the Lord came to Shimei, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren. Return every man to his house, for this thing is done of me. And they obeyed the words of the Lord and returned from going against Jeroboam. And Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities for defense in Judah. He built even Bethlehem and Etam and Tekoa and Bethsur and Sukkah and Adullam and Gath and Marashah and Ziph and Adoram and Lachesh and Azekiah and Zorah and Ajalon and Hebron, which are in Judah and in Benjamin then cities. And he forfeited the strongholds and put captains in them and store of victual and of oil and wine. And every several city he put shields and spears and made them exceedingly strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coasts. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had cast off they am off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. And he ordained them priests for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. Amen. Just ending this morning at the end of verse 17. And knowing the Lord himself will add his own divine blessing upon the reading there. So let's just unite our hearts together again as we come to the preaching of God's Word. I've entitled the message this morning, This Thing is Done of Me. This Thing is Done of Me of me. Let's unite our hearts. Father in heaven, we thank Thee again for Thy Word. Thy Word, it is truth. Thy Word, it is a comfort to our hearts. Thy Word, it is a challenge. And, O oh God, Thy Word, it is a living book. And Lord, we pray that Thou would bless us even in our little study this morning. Fill me with the power of Thy Spirit, that I might preach as thus, and thus saith the Lord. Lord, we've read even those very words this morning in this passage. And, O oh God, I pray Thou would take thy word by thy spirit. Thou would apply it even to individual hearts and homes today. Individual loved ones that are listening in, maybe from other churches. We do remember our other congregations today. Remember those especially that have no pastor and are vacant in the pulpit. Lord, that thou would speak even at this time. Thou would guide thy people. And Lord, we pray that they might know the man of God's choosing. O oh God, Lord, we pray that there be a word to every heart, to every heart, Lord, whether young or old alike. And Lord, that I would be pleased to meet with us. And we might be able to say in a little while, the Lord was with us and we heard his voice speaking to our hearts. So Lord, hear and answer our prayer and abide with us now. For we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen.
the new normal is social distancing, queuing up to get the groceries and to go into the post office. The new normal is not being able to have that close contact with friends or family. And it is the removal of various aspects of life that were very much part of our everyday living, including how we bury our loved ones. There is a hive of activity, we might say, in the science laboratories, not only to give their educated view on the manner in which the virus is spreading, but also there's a rush on to get a vaccine for it. And yet still in all of it, there's no consideration of God. Very few in high places want even to mention God. The God of heaven is not in all their thoughts. And they think that they can rule and they can make wise decisions without bringing God into the equation. Just, I think it was yesterday, I took a little booklet down from my library. And it's on the end times. And it's by Alan Toms. And he's reviewing a little piece of Matthew chapter 24. And I was interested to read these verses, or these words that he penned. He says, But alas, man pursues his course, leaves God out, seeks to find his own solution to his problems, and seals his doom in the day of judgment. The interesting thing about that is that was penned in the early 1960s. And yet how applicable those very words are to our present circumstances today. Man, man pursues his course and leaves God out. He seeks his own wisdom to his own problems. Men and women, the Lord God rules supreme in heaven. That is accepted by many. But that the Lord God rules and is in control in the things of earth is widely denied. And that perception is only increased in the light of the present pandemic. There are two choices only. Either it is God who is in control or it is the devil. Uh, but to state that the devil is in control is to declare that God is defeated. And while that is the conclusion of the ungodly, and that will be the conclusion of the carnal-minded. It can never be the conclusion that the believer rests upon. And many yet will counter that by saying, but the world is in chaos. Sin is abounding in every hand and rampant. There's confusion in every side. Everything is out of joint. Think of the spiritual realm. There's no concern for the things that are spiritual. There is nothing of God in all their thinking. And many who do have an ear for spiritual matters are subjected to a God who is some effeminate, helpless being who commands the respect of no one and who needs the help of man if his plan is to succeed in saving the lost. And that sort of rhetoric, men and women, does nothing but dethrone God. And it strips him from being omnipotent to being impotent. But they are people, that is not the God that I read in the Scriptures. In fact, it couldn't be any further from the truth. And it is seen in this very passage that we're reading this morning. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, had taken over the kingdom. However soon he was to lose much, much of it to a rival in the person of Jeroboam. Hence the terms Israel and Judah that are used from this time forth. The start of the chapter sees Rehoboam back in Jerusalem raising an army so that he can go against those northern tribes that are termed Israel so as to cause them to return to him that was in Judah. But the message from God was different. A message that I want you to consider this morning in the words of verse 4. Thus saith the Lord, you shall not go up nor fight against your brethren. Return every man to his house, for this thing is done of me. And they obeyed the words of the Lord and returned from going against Jeroboam. Won't you notice here the division? 
With what Rehoboam inherited was a complete kingdom. And Israel, which was united and one which was great. But what his dynasty was to comprise of was soon to be just of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. There was a division. A division which left Israel split into two nations. Rehoboam left with just two tribes remaining true to the house of David. But there are some things that we must learn about this division because it was something that was regrettable. What happened at this time was to alter everything. But how different it could have been for Rehoboam. He could have followed in the footsteps of his father and have been successful. He could have been a wise-hearted king. But that was forfeited when he was faced with a petition from an old-time enemy of his father's day. You look back to chapter 10. Second Chronicles 10, and the words of verse 4, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of thy father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us, and we will serve thee. There's a proposition there. The desire was that the heavy yoke that was upon this enemy might be eased and that they would subject themselves to being his servants. But what was to transpire was a losing of his own people and a division having been forged among them. And that is something that is regrettable among the people of God. How often it is known in business circles, there's a division between directors. The business splits up. How common, unfortunately, and prevalent it is within homes, even Christian homes, where there's a division between a man and a wife. Disastrous. Disastrous are the consequences to all concerned, not least the children. But it is most regretted when it comes into the work of God, into the church of Jesus Christ. For the body of God's people are to be marked by unity and togetherness. That is what the Scriptures would exhort. You remember the early church, even as they met in Acts 1 in that upper room, and they were waiting for the promise of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. They're said to be in one accord. They were in one heart and in one mind. And they were fulfilling what God desired. I read to you earlier on from Psalm 126, 133, however, says this, Psalm 133, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And men and women, look at the last verse, only three verses in it. It says there the Lord commands the blessing. It's in that spirit. That spirit is where we know the blessing of God. Conversely, the devil is about the work of division so that the blessing of God might be forfeited. And hence we have the Apostle Paul exhorting the church there at Ephesus about this very truth. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, with all love, lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This division was regrettable. It always is. But this division, like many others, was avoidable. When the proposition came to Rehoboam, it was his response that caused the division. And while the request was reasonable, and while we may suspect that there was more to it than meets the eye, if we know anything of the character of Jeroboam, yet we also know that the Scriptures tell us that a soft answer turneth away wrath. And common sense might have granted the request without any hesitation. Rehoboam, however, was to seek further counsel in the matter. But the problem came when he was to reject the right counsel and he was to accept the counsel of the younger men. Reason might indicate that the older men knew Jeroboam. They would have known his actions even in the time of Solomon. They were in a better position, therefore, to make a judgment than those who didn't. No, Jeroboam. The response to the petition is noted in chapter 10, verse 7. And they spake unto him, saying, If thou be kind, be kind to this people, and please them, and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever. 
But it was that that counsel that was rejected, for Rehoboam, he turns to the counsel of the young man whose answer was harsh, and it encouraged an even heavier burden. A division was made. This decision cost Rehoboam most of his kingdom and a division that could have been avoided. And what arises is therefore one of those if-onlys from a human standpoint. Have you been there? Do you know all about them? If you look back on a situation, if only I hadn't said that. If only I hadn't done that to that fellow brother or sister in Christ, then there would be that sweet communion still with us today. If only. But I want you to note also that this division was prophesied. Again, I, I turn you back to chapter 10, verse 15. So the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was of God, that the Lord might perform his word, which he spake by the hand of Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. The cause was of God. It was the word that God had stated during the latter days of the reign of Solomon. He had departed from the Lord by his idolatry, and God foretold that the punishment would be the rising of Jeroboam and the taking of the tribes. It brings us back to second, uh, I beg your pardon, First Kings chapter eleven. First Kings chapter eleven. If I can read to you, verse twenty-nine. And this is where uh, first, uh, Second Chronicles 10 uh, brings us to. And that verse 15 that I've read. Verse 29 of First Kings 11. It came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite found him in the way and he had clad himself with a new garment. And they too were alone in the field. Verse 31. And he said to Jeroboam, Take ye ten pieces. For thus saith the Lord God, the God of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to thee. Verse 33. Because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes and to keep my statutes and my judgments as did David his father. The responsibility was Rehoboam's, but the cause was of God. God is in control. God was fulfilling his prophetic word. The men and women, while he is faithful to words of mercy, and he is, mercies that are new every morning, great is his faithfulness. He is also faithful to his words of judgment and wrath. And that includes the prophetic scriptures. I made reference to that little booklet that I read just yesterday, or part of which. I want to illustrate what I just said to you. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, the disciples meet with the Lord and they asked him privately, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? They're interested. They want to know what's going to happen. And that is the curiosity of many people even to this day. Men and women, just take a little moment to look at three verses that I'll draw your attention to. Verse 5. The Lord gives the answer to them. He says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Religiously, there is confusion. That's the spirit that will be abroad in the end time. There's no reference to the Bible there. But there will be those that will come and say, I'm Christ. And they're deceivers. Verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Politically, there will be conflict just prior to the Lord's return. So we have seen it religiously in verse 5, politically in verse 6. Let's go on, verse 7. 
For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Globally, there will be calamities. And do we not see something of that even today? But don't forget verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. I bring that as an illustrative passage to your hearts to tell you, to remind you that God's words prophetically will be fulfilled. God's words of judgment and wrath will yet come to pass. I want to remind you that God keeps His word. And that is why things turned out as they did in the reign of, of Rehoboam. God's judgments are unsearchable. And as way as past finding out, Isaiah 55 verse 8 and 9 would come to the fore where it says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He is one who worketh out all things according to the counsel of his own will. And when we realize this, then it brings untold comfort to our hearts that nothing takes God by surprise. And it encourages us to look beyond people, to look beyond circumstances, to look to the God who is in control, who is furthering his purpose and plans for the good of his people. And he does it through various means. I want you to continue in my text this morning to see, hear the declaration. Rehoboam was set for going against those who had rebelled, but the message from Shimei was to be heard. You'll notice in my text, verse 4, that he is a message of thus saith the Lord. This wasn't just some message from a wise man. This wasn't just some man's initiative. This was coming, we read from verse 2, a man of God. What a title. And he comes to Rehoboam the king, and he says, Thus saith the Lord, they were not to fight against their brethren, but rather they were to return to their own houses. All prefacing an enlightening declaration where it says, This thing is done of me. Consider its scope. God was at work in this whole situation. The providential dealings and workings of God is not just confined to those things that are good. Otherwise, who will be in charge when the things don't go well, when things go wrong and they're evil? To say it as the devil would be to conclude that God's sovereignty is limited. But that is not the God of the Bible as was revealed unto Moses, even when God showed himself to him from the burning bush in the backside of the desert. I want to read to you Exodus chapter 4 in the words of verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? The same truth that is conveyed in the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 45, and this time verse 7. It simply says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now, that's not to say that God is the author of sin. And neither does it imply that God approves of wrong or he approves of evil. There is man's responsibility. And isn't that seen in its fullest sense when we get to Calvary? For there Christ was delivered up according to the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God. In other words, God had decreed it from eternity past. But nevertheless, the Jews were those who were guilty of taking the Christ of God. And by wicked hands, they were to slay Him. They were to crucify Him there on Golgotha's brow. It could also be written across Calvary. For this thing is done of me. For the scope of this declaration is all embracing. It includes everything. It was John Owen, the great Puritan, who said this. 
The whole course of affairs in the world is steered by providence in reference to the good of God's church. Numerous scriptures would back up such a statement as that. What about Romans chapter 11 and the words of verse 36? It says, For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. What about Ephesians chapter 1 and the words of verse 11? In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. God was at con in control at Calvary. God was in control when Daniel was in the lion's den. He shut their mouths. God was in control when the three Hebrew children would not fall down and worship the idol, but were cast into the fiery furnace, Christ being in the midst of them. God was in control when Joseph was wrongly accused by his master's wife. And dear loved one this morning listening in under the sound of the preaching of the word, the almighty, all-knowing, all-seeing God is still in control. Praise his name. You'll see also that this declaration is specific. The matter of the ten tribes separating from the other two the matter in history of Jeroboam doing what he did was known unto God. The people revolting and following the usurper was done of God. It applied to this event and it applies to the specific situations in each of our lives. Job could say in Job chapter 23 and verse 14, Job 23, 14, For he performeth the thing that is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. Job didn't fall into the trap where many of us are guilty of, of only seeing the person, of only seeing the circumstances by which something happens. He recognized that God is sovereign. And that means he is supreme. It declares that he is God. It declares that he is the Almighty, the possessor of all power in heaven and on earth, and that none can thwart his purposes or resist his will. It declares what Paul could write at the end of his life to young Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15, which in his times referring to Christ in verse 14, he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And men and women, that's different to the God that is portrayed from many a modern pulpit today. It's the very opposite. When we declare that God is sovereign, we affirm that it is his right to govern the universe which he has made for his own glory, just as he pleases. He is under no rule or law apart from his own nature. And he certainly is under no obligation to give account to anyone else. He is God. He is Jehovah. He is sovereign in his power the power that was exercised over the mouths of the lions. The same power, however, that was withheld on other occasions. As Hebrews chapter 11 states, others had cruel mockings, scourgings. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were slain with the sword. He's sovereign in his mercy. He will have mercy upon whom he will have mercy. He's sovereign in his grace. He shows his undeserved favor unto those whom he chooses. For this thing is done of me. And can I just say, that is all the more reason to your own save loved one listening in. All the more reason why you ought not to spurn away the day of God's grace to your soul. The day of God's opportunity for you in this very different day in which you're living. May you consider your latter end. May you consider your undone state before a holy God. May you consider Calvary as we've already made reference to that God gave his son to die for sinners such as you and I. Don't don't turn your back on the day of God's grace to your soul as God is speaking loudly in this time. 
There's one final thought that I want you to see in the text, and that is the doer. It was the Lord, you see, who spoke these words through His servant, Shimei. It's absolutely clear that God is the doer of this thing and indeed all things. And therein lies some lessons for us to learn. The first being this. We are given this reminder to look to God. And that is the fundamental difference between the ungodly and the child of God. The ungodly, the carnal-minded, they always start with the world and they try to make the things of the world make their way back to God. Their conclusion then that is reached is God is out of touch. God has no connection with the world at all. God is not interested with my circumstances. That's their conclusion. But the believer who walks by faith, he starts with God. And then he works himself down to man. And so therefore, his conclusion, her conclusion is this, because God is holy, His anger will burn against sin. Because God is righteous, His judgments will fall upon people and on nations who have rebelled against Him, who have forgotten God. Because God is faithful, then His solemn threatening will be fulfilled. And the classic example is the old Jacob when he said, Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. The reality was that God was working out all things for their good. Dear loved one, this morning, maybe in the deepest valley of fear, or of sickness, or of illness, or of trial, or of suffering, in the most strange and difficult days that we find ourselves in, along with most other citizens in this world. Remember, look to God. Rehoboam was reminded to do just that by this message from Shimei. Look to God. But see also the response. What would Rehoboam do in the light of what he had just been told? He simply was re resigned to obey and to submit to the perfect will of God. You'll note the closing words of our text. He obeyed God's command. He obeyed it. He accepted the situation. He didn't try to change it by force. What God had done, what God will yet do, is not for us to question or try to undo. The happiest and the safest place to be in is under His gracious hand, in the center of His will. If God will not change the circumstances, then He has something better. He's something higher for us. Note the remnant in this passage. Thus saith the Lord, if I could read the text again, ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren. Return every man to his house, for this thing is done of me. And they obeyed the words of the Lord and returned from going against Jeroboam. The thing that God did for Rehoboam was leave him with just a small number of people. That became known as the southern kingdom of Judah. Israel to the north, Judah to the south. The larger tribes under Jeroboam and their idolatry and all that went along with it were never to have good kings. Many of them were to deflect back to Judah where the knowledge and the worship of Jehovah God was to continue. You see, men and women, where apostasy was to take the ten tribes into oblivion. In Judah, they were to have, by and large, good kings. And the messianic line was preserved. And Rehoboam is included in the genealogy of Christ when you get to Matthew chapter 1. It was through this small remnant that God brought forth the greatest blessing of all, even the giving of His only begotten Son. What is this teaching us? God often uses the small number the remnant who are faithful to Him. When the church is diminished, when the church is brought low, and especially when it has happened through its own foolishness and its own sin, like it was with Rehoboam, God is yet faithful. 
and does such things as part of his greater plan. His purposes will not be denied. They will not be derailed. He will build his church. Listen to me. God is in control. Let me ask in closing, is he controlling your life? So whatever you may face, and whatever circumstances that you have to endure are passed through, that as a child of his, you're able to say, for this thing is done of my Lord and my God. That's the sweetest place to be in. May God help us to acknowledge that. May God's reminder come forcefully upon our hearts this morning to remember Him in the midst of all that's happening. And may He be keen over our lives for His glory's sake. And even over all their lives. This morning that are listening in, yet unsaved. May you bow the knee at the foot of the old rugged cross. Acknowledge Christ as your Lord, as your Savior, and as your King. May God bless His Word to each of our hearts for His own name's sake. Let's unite our hearts together in closing in a word of prayer. Just saying again, thank you for joining with us even today. Our Father and our God, we thank Thee for Thy Word. We bless the Lord that it is truth. Thank the Lord that Thou art in control, as I was even in the days of Rehoboam. And Lord, how Thou didst cause Rehoboam to obey the message of thus saith the Lord. And the armies returned to their houses. And Lord, Thou didst bless the little remnant that were with him. And not even those in Judah returned again, even to the worship and to the sacrifices that were made unto the only true and living God. We pray, Lord, for such a return in our own province in these days, that there will be a return from frivolous things, there will be a return from false religions, there will be a return unto God, there will be, Lord, men and women return from their sin, and they would seek the Lord while they may be found, and they be found at Calvary's cross by faith. O God, cause such a a move of Thy Spirit, even on such a day. Father, hear our prayer. Bless us the rest of this Sabbath. Do us each one good. Meet with us. For we pray these things in our Savior's name and for God's eternal glory. Amen.